Big Cash from Sydney, how you doing, bro? Hey, what's going on, bro? No, not much, man. Just kick it back. It's good to finally meet you, eh? Yeah, man. It's the first time uh, on the lesson, so thanks for taking the time to jump on, dude. Nah, whatever you need, man. Um, now, look, you are one of the most controversial uh, MCs talking. in the game at the moment. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're going to get stuck in, a, in a everything. Yeah, 100%. Um, 100%. But when, uh, when I was doing my research... I didn't realize that you've been actually, you know, dabbling in the rap thing for quite a while. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, there'd be a lot of people out there who'd think you'd just come on the scene in the last year or two. Yeah, that's the, the, the um, funny thing about it. Eh? I see a lot of the comments there like, oh, he's improving with every song. <laughs> I've been in the scene since I was like 15. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, that's one of the things that I, you know, yeah, I realized yeah. as I was doing my research, it was like, oh, okay, wow, there's a bit of history here. Yeah, yeah. And um, I want to sort of walk through pretty much a whole career front to back. Yeah, yeah. And I want to even start before the music. Yeah. Um, now, I guess first and foremost, uh, you know, where are you from? Like, what, uh, what area did you grow up in? Oh, in, what area I grew up in? I grew up around Smithfield, Fairfield area. Someone from South Australia um, who has no idea about Sydney, that yeah. particular area, I mean, what was it like growing up in that area? Is that a safe area or is that a bit of a oh, rough it was, area? It was pretty It was pretty violent. There, there was a few islanders there, but not many. I, I, I was raised, mostly, mostly raised around um, uh, Arabs, Assyrians. Like the whole area is full of Assyrians and they were just shooting each other when we were young, you know what I mean? There was a lot of killings and murders and that. So, um, so yeah, it was pretty full on back then. For a young kid to see, like, to be around shit like that, it's like pretty, it plays with your head, you know? So, if you talk about seeing that shit when you're young, I guess, you know, how, how young are you talking? Uh, I, I didn't really, like, physically see it. Like, you know, you just sit on the news, you hang around the station, then you hear about things and that. Like, I was probably around, like, 14, 15. And then I guess with the violence comes the drugs. Yeah, the, yeah, the drugs and, and the sort of turf wars shit. and then everyone's just killing each other with drugs. And then, I mean, as 14, 15, you know, being around that, yeah. uh, you know, did that influence you and, you know, is that how you got into the street life sort of shit? Yeah, it influenced me a bit, but probably what really, what really, what really made me turn to the street life was um, I, had a lot of, I had a lot of issues with my father when we were young. He was very, he was very violent towards me. I think um, you already know this. You would have heard it in one of my other interviews, but I didn't really go, go in depth with the interviewer. But um, yeah, that co contributed to a lot of my um, gang banging years later, you know what I mean? So, mm. so you would say that it's the domestic violence? Yeah, domestic violence played a big part in me, like throwing away my life. Because I did it just to get back at my father, you know what I mean? I grew up with a lot of resentment towards him and it just... Like, even to this day, we, like, we don't talk anymore. He still keeps in contact with my siblings, but we don't talk at all, you know? Yeah, just a, wow. yeah, just a few issues that uh, recently happened. I don't want to talk about it. Like, I don't want to cover those issues now, but later on, maybe. But not now. It's, too, it's still a bit of a touchy subject, you know? So. Now, I guess, you know, domestic violence being something that lots of people in, ex in Australia experience. Yeah, 100%. As someone who went through it and can see the effect that it had on them. Yeah. If people are watching that are going through domestic violence, yeah. what sort of advice would you have to give, if any? Like, just speak up, man. Like, speak to someone, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, if someone's abusing your mother or abusing you, you need to open your mouth. I never said nothing to no one. Like, I, I remember I was in year eight, I went to school, I was covered in purple, I got detention one afternoon, and I couldn't go. So then I went to the office, and I would try to make up an, an excuse because my dad was waiting for me at the front. And I was all, all, almost started crying. And she goes, what's wrong? And then she went to grab my arm and then I flinched. And she goes, what's wrong? Are you hurt? And she goes, take off your blazer. I took off my blazer and my whole arm was purple. Like sometimes it helps just to open your mouth and talk, you know? Keeping it to yourself doesn't do anything. Because the, 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 the domestic violence just carries on and on and on until someone ends up getting murdered or something, you know what I mean? And then so, you know, being 14, 15, around domestic violence in an area where there's, you know, street violence, yeah, yeah. drugs, etc. Yeah. Where and how did the street stuff progress for you from that point? Probably 
I was always a naughty kid. When I turned probably 15, 16, I moved to Mount Jewel. I moved to Mount Jewel and then that's where I got, that was the area that made me bad. That's when I started getting real fucked up. Like I started um, getting involved in gang culture. Because in, Fairf in Fairfield, I was just a little naughty cunt. But then when we moved to Mount Jewel, because my father, my parents were pastors. The bloke was, he, <laughs> it, it's, it's a pretty fucked up story, eh? The bloke's a pastor, he's the most violent man I've ever met in my life. But he's, a, but, you understand what I'm saying? Like he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that's very interesting because a pastor it's a, it's, it's is a pretty the same story. as like a preacher. Because <laughs> on one hand, he's a pastor preaching the word of God. And on the other hand, he's abusing the fuck out of his son. You know what I mean? So it was yeah, wow. pretty messed up. So then we moved to Mount Jewel because he got moved. So he got placed um, in Mount Jewel at one of the churches they had there. I'm um, in Edmonton. And then the, the feud between me and him just kept going. So then I ran away from home. I was homeless. I just took off. I started joining gangs. That's where I got heavily involved in gangs in Mount Jewel. It really fucked me up. That area really is, how, it really is what they advertise it. It's fucked up. So how old were you when you moved to Mount Druid? About 15, 16. I remember I got kicked out of Patrician Brothers in Fairfield and then I had to go to Blacktown Boys and then... But it ended up working out because when we moved there, I went to Blacktown Boys, so... Now, as someone from South Australia, I've heard of Mount Druid. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's got obviously a pretty gritty reputation and I reckon I've seen some videos online and shit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, oh, that, you, you, that kind of stuff... It's been it's always been happening, like since back then. It's, it's nothing normal. Like to the to the island to the islander community, that's just another it's just another day. But like to the general public, they're like, oh, they're a bunch of animals. They're savages. Because <laughs> you see, like twenty blokes jumping on one dude. You know what I mean? So can you walk us through your memory uh, when you first you know arrived at Mount Druitt? Yeah, yeah. And you know how. You know, you got involved in the gangs, and which gangs did you get involved in, and then what sort of activities were sort of happening at that age? Yeah, oh, I put around sixteen. Um, I actually got introduced f to a few of the boys in the area from a friend of mine that was already staying in Mount Jewett, but we went to church together. And then he s introduced me to s to a few of his friends. We started drinking, and then I got familiar with the area and that. Met all the boys, started doing all these other shit. We went robbing houses, doing all this dumb shit. Started drinking together, and then I ended up joining a gang. Long story short, because you know me, I like to blabber on. Long story short, um, I ended up joining, the first gang I ever joined was called uh, NFP. Niggas from the Pacific. <laughs> Everyone from Mount Jewett know this gang as well. They're one of the first ever. So I ended up joining them. And then fucking, the cunts just ended up bullying me, man. I got bullied a lot. Yeah, they never accepted me. Because I was like a little white kid. <laughs> I don't think they liked it. I got jump block about, I probably got jump block 13 times, I think. I got the shit kicked out of me. Like just random, we'd be drinking with the boys and they'd just turn to me when, when they get drunk and just jump on my head, you know? I'd go home all banged up and my mum would be like, oh, what's wrong, what's wrong? I'd go, oh, no, no, I just had a fight, I just had a fight. How long were you in that crew? And then, you know, at which point did you move on? Oh, I was in that crew for about, Ah, probably a year or two. Probably about a year or two. And then we ended up having, as I got older, I started realising things for what they were and then we started having issues. And then I broke off. Um, and then we started our own crew of the boys at church. So then from there we started a crew, um, it was called RTB, uh, Rufus Tongan Brothers. We were just little kids. All my brothers and I were involved, my little, my little nephews. We were, all involved in, uh, we were all involved in it together. And we used to beef with other areas like Guildford and all that. Anyone, like Guildford, Granville. So it was like Mount Jewel versus everyone else. That's where that drama comes from today. Not, not, not many people know that. You know the whole district thing with 27 and 21? We started that like fucking back then when I was like 18. Like everyone thinks it was a thing that happened five years ago, but we were the ones that started it. It used to be, we used to jump on trains, go down there, fuck a few of them up, then come back to Mount they'd do the same. You just back and forth, back and forth. And then 10, 15 years later, it's the 27 and 21 drama. You know what I mean? Not many people know that. We were just boys at church. We were just church boys. 
And like we would just get, we, you know, guys from different areas where, like bad cunts, they just have a habit of sleeping with the same women. It happens all the time. And then someone's missus will, will, will shit go him and then go fuck a cunt from, from Granville and then that's how it starts, you know what I mean? And then cunts get chopped over something they had nothing to do with. And I guess, you know, amongst this whole period of time, yeah. um, you know, from your mid-teens yeah. late into your late teens and you're in Mount Druitt, is the rapping a thing at all yet or that hasn't come about yet? I was always rapping since I was a kid. I was like, um, I was always heavily influenced with music, man. Because when I was a kid, like I said, I sound like a broken record. There was a lot of violence in my household and um, I used to use music as an escape. So I was always familiar with music. You know what I mean? So I started rapping at a young age, but I didn't really take it serious until, oh, I don't think I took it serious at all. It started becoming a thing around 17, 18. Okay, yeah. so still when you're... Um, yeah, exactly what you said when I was involved in the... started coming up with the gang shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's sort of happening around the same yeah, time. Because yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. streets and hip-hop yeah, have yeah, that yeah. relationship. Yeah. Now, I guess with the street shit, where did it sort of progress to from there? Yeah, I ended up beefing with the whole area. Like, so we were staying in Mount Jewel, but I was beefing with every country from there. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then, so where did things sort of escalate to or turn from there? Um, I just started hanging around. I just got sick of Islanders, man, and I just started hanging around the Arabs. I went back to my old Arab mates that I grew up with. When you've gone back um, to hanging out with those guys, is that when the motorcycle club stuff? Yeah, think, think, yeah. I, a lot of things change for me because they, they, they're criminals on a different level, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not having to step at my own race or anything, but there's only a select few of us that know how to make money and like move properly in the street. The rest of them, they're just like petty thugs, you know? Like the majority of these little wannabe drillers, you know? When you talk about, you know, your transition into the motorcycle club, can you talk about when that happened and how that happened? Yeah, I could, well, I can speak about it a little bit. So around probably 20, 21, I started hanging around. You know how the game works. You just get introduced to certain people, you know what I mean? And then you just level up, level by level. You start selling this, you start selling coke, you start selling this. Make a bit more money. The more money you make, the more people you get introduced to, then the networking. Like you network with more and more people. And then eventually I bumped into a few people. And um, I just decided to take it to the next level and I ended up jumping on with the, um, with the commerce. That was the first club I went to. Now, I guess when, uh, you know, when you become involved in a club like that, yeah. uh, things, things I imagine level up and yeah, yeah. become a new level of seriousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. That's what I'm always telling these young kids, you know what I mean? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta play every level. You can't just jump and expect to make money. Like you've got to go every single level because it's like conditioning to when you get to that point where if you get caught, you won't rap. You know what I mean? Because you, you play at every level. A lot of them just skip it. They're born into families that have a lot of money and then like they're just, they're just given the opportunity. You know what I mean? So then when they do get done, they're not prepared for it because they've never been in the street at all. You've got to play every single level. You know what I mean? You can't just jump the queue. You jump the queue, that's how you go crown witness and you rap. Like every level is conditioning for the next level. You know what I mean? And then so when you talk about getting to the level where you joined the Common Cheros, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk uh, about, you know, why you chose to make that move and how that experience was for you? Oh, the reason I chose, I just decided to fucking, because, oh man, I had a lot of, fun, a lot of anger, man, a lot of anger and um, I just wanted to hurt cunts, man. I had a lot of anger in my heart, you know what I mean, towards my father and, that, and a, lot, a lot of other things as well, my upbringing and that. So I just wanted to make money as well. And um, yeah, just take it to the next level, man. I just wanted to hurt, hurt people. That was it. Hurt people and make money along the way. And when you talk about wanting to hurt people, you know, you talk about uh, having resentment towards your father yeah, yeah, yeah. as well as I other things from your childhood. I wanted everyone to feel what I felt in my heart from my father. You know what I mean? Now... You've decided to, you know, step it up. 
Yeah. You've joined the Common Cheros. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how old were you when that happened and how long were you a member of that club for? Oh, probably around my 20s, 22, 23 maybe. Um, it was so long ago, man. I would say 22, 23 now and then on another interview you say 21. It just, everything happened so fast. Yeah, so somewhere in your early sort of yeah, 20s. Yeah, yeah. my early 20s. And how long approximately do you think you were a member of that club for? I lasted about six months. Okay. And when you say, you know, I lasted, yeah. uh, that instantly gives me the impression that it was like difficult to, you know, sustain that lifestyle or? Oh, not really sustain it. It's just I was really out of control. I just, I wasn't listening to anyone. I was, I'm, I'm lucky I didn't get knocked. To be honest, I was like just very un. Well, you couldn't control me at all. I had a fallout with um a few of the boys, and then they just decided to let me go. But yeah, mm. but that club, eh? Shout out to all the boys from from my chapter that, uh, back then, eh? And then so um, when you've when you've dipped out of that situation, what happened f from there? Did you join another club? Yeah, I ended up defecting over to the Hell's Angels, East Lakes chapter. And then, so how long in between, you know, was it straight away or? No, it wasn't straight away. It was probably, probably two to three weeks. I got hit up uh, through my brother-in-law. Um, at the time, the president of, uh, the president of um, East Lakes chapter, his name was Sui. And he had a brother, he had a brother that worked with my brother-in-law. And they ended up finding out about me getting booted out. So then he hit up my brother-in-law to hit me up to go join them, to come for a meeting. When you've transitioned into the Hells Angels, uh, to my understanding, in, in, that, in that life, going from one club to another club can come with its challenges and difficulties. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, did you experience any of that? Uh, yeah, 100%. Probably 80% of the club didn't want me there because they knew a war was brewing. A war would have kicked off, but they already had dramas between them. And if they took me, um, it would have kicked off 100%. But the actual president of uh, East Lake Chapter, Sui, shout out to Sui, he actually took me on. He told the whole club, he goes, he's coming with me, I'm taking him. If it wasn't for that and they didn't take me, fuck, I would have got knocked straight out. Because country defect over, that's practically, to the, to the guys in the club, it's like you, you, you're giving this all up, you know what I mean? You're leaving us, you got all the information on us, you're, def you're def defecting over to them, you're a fucking dog, you know what I mean? That's where that whole, oh, if you leave, they kill you comes from. And then how long were you a member of the Hells Angels for? For about f five, six years. Yeah, okay, so yeah. much longer. Yeah I, was a, uh, yeah, I was a sergeant of the arms at uh, East Lakes. And then, uh, without obviously going into, you know, specific detail, yeah, yeah, yeah. in that you know, five year period. Yeah. How did your life change? And for someone like myself, the audience who don't get to see, you know, what goes on in that life. Yeah, what, what goes on behind the scenes. How, how does it, you know, how does it affect or how did it affect you and what kind of lifestyle were you living? Can you yeah. paint us a picture? Well, at the time, it didn't really affect me. It, um, it more so affects me now. Like, the paranoia, can't sleep. But at that time, you know, I didn't care. I was loving life, you know what I mean? I was just parties every day, brothels. It's just like a practically it's just a big party. That's all it is. Yeah, so basically, I guess in a way, the way that it's portrayed on television or whatnot yeah. is somewhat accurate. The clubs, oh, the no, strippers. No, 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 no. TV the, doesn't do that life justice at all, I'm telling you. It's different. It's like you walk into the clubhouse, they're having orgies. Um, it works hand in hand with the rap game. It's like sort of the same thing. It's like you're famous, but you're not famous. Like you walk into a club, everyone knows who you are and everyone's trying to get at your table, you know what I mean? It's like, that's why it was so easy for me to pick up the music because it it's just me being myself. It's like, oh yeah. That's the party side of the life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's also the other side of the yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that maybe one thing that TV or music does mm. is it shows the party side and it doesn't show the consequence. Yeah, never shows the consequences. Now, can you discuss, I guess, 
not in detail, yeah, yeah. but what are some of the consequences based on the things that you have seen from your yeah, experience yeah. of living that life? Like some of the consequences, jail, death, drug addiction, paranoia, mental health issues. Like it just, that whole lifestyle just cooks you up. You know what I mean? When you talk about uh, jail time, yeah. um, because I hear, you know, basically the streets will end up in two places, mm. uh, dead or in jail. Yeah, in a box or jail. Um, now, for yourself, uh, I understand that you have done some jail time. When was the first time that, you know, that you got sent away? How long was it for and what was it for? Oh, back when I was... Probably about 19, 20. That was probably the first time. Okay, so that was before you were in the club. Yeah. Probably about 19, 20, but I ended up getting bail from Silverwater. I was in there for like a month. I ended up getting bail for um, an armed robbery and kidnap charge. I ended up um, getting it brought down to take and detain and enter with intent. So I ended up getting... Uh, Two and a half years weekend detention for it. So what's two and a half years weekend detention? It was back when they were doing um, weekend detention. You go, so you go jail on Friday night and then they release you on, uh, on Sunday. They were doing it at Para Jail. They had a section there. Did they still do that now? Oh, no, nah, they ended up cancelling that. Now they just got community service. ICU orders in it. Okay, so the first time that you went in was for weekend jail. Yeah, no, no, no. The first time I went in was for that charge. We got, we ended up getting getting done for that um that armed robbery. So I went to Silverwater. I was there for about a month and a half, and then I got bail because it was the first offence. That's the only reason why I got bail. Yeah, because it was it was the first offence. So in your early twenties uh, is when you've had that charge, and then after that, you've had to go to weekend jail. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then after that, uh, you've had to go back in at some stage? Yeah, I was just in and out from then on. But it was never for long. I, I'd catch a charge, I'd go in, I'd be in for a few months and then get bail. And then I'd fight the charge, beat it. It was like that all the way till I was like 28, 29. Yeah, okay. So then in total, approximately how much time do you think that you've served oh, to the system? Well, I don't know, probably maybe, maybe two, three but not all in one go. For someone who's actually served, you know, two, three years in there in total, uh, what is prison life really like? You know, and can you recall your first, you know, what it was like when you first went in there? Were you nervous? Were you scared? Yeah, man, I, I was practically a kid. I was like 20. You go in there and you're nervous. You don't know what to expect, you know what I mean? All the cunts that you've had dramas with outside, and then you're there, you're thinking, oh, what's going to happen when you go in? You're walking through reception, you can hear everyone screaming. They're, they're straight off the street. And then you, you go to the screw, you do the paperwork, and they ask you, you want to go protective custody? I didn't know what that was at that time, you know what I mean? And I, and I was asking questions. He goes, oh, do you want to go to protection? I go, no, 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 no fuck that. And then I'll, you, you go into the back gate and you're waiting to, get to go to the wing. And when you're walking into the wing, everyone's screaming, you know what I mean? And you're like 20 years old, you don't know what's going on. You're looking around, you're like, fuck. And everyone that's talking through the windows, you think they're plotting on you, but really they're not. They're just having conversation. But it's your first time there. You get butterflies in your gut, you get scared, you know what I mean? In the time that you've spent in there, uh, can you discuss, I guess, some of the things that you actually witnessed in there? Just stabbings. Just stabbings, fights. People getting their guts like sliced open, um, blokes getting raped. Look, it's crazy in there, man. So that shit really that that shit happened. Yeah, they call it they they call it getting scotched. And now it's becoming a normal thing. Cunts cunts are actually doing it. Like and people are pe people are letting it slide. Back when I done jail back then, that that's when jail was jail. Now it's just ridiculous now. So explain what you mean by back then versus now. Like back then, everyone had the, the, the criminals had morals back then. Like everyone was going toe to toe. Now it's just changed. The younger generation is just—they're all fried and cooked, man. Cunts jumping each other. People signing cunts out of the boneyard. 
like fucking just doing fruity shit. Now, while you've been inside, in and out, the rap shit, how much have you been writing rhymes or freestyling? Or yeah, oh, that was always going. Music? No matter what I was, like, no matter what I was doing in life, I was always writing music. I was always writing songs. I downloaded instrumentals. I was always, it, it was always a part of me, man. No matter where I was, whether I was in a jail cell, whether I was off on some crime spree, I always had a notepad with me and I was just writing. You know what I mean? The new single. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, Unbreakable. Now, let's, uh, let, let, let's break this one down. Um, this is, in my opinion, what will be a classic in X amount of years. Uh, that, hey, that means a lot to me, man. Cheers to that, brother. The, the story behind the song alone let alone the actual track plus the visuals yeah. and your whole story. At the very beginning of the song, it's got the, um, the new snippets of the shooting that occurred yeah, not yeah, too yeah. long ago. Correct. Now, without going into too much detail, obviously, um, everybody knows to some degree what happened. Yeah. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. To my understanding... Basically, a few cars pulled up around you, fired off some shots. Yeah, yeah. You got hit in the got hit in the arm, protecting your partner. Yeah. And you know that individual, or those individuals now have a case going. So we won't talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's in a nutshell what has happened. Obviously, uh, the news cameras and the police attend the scene. And you've taken the snippets yeah. from the news reports and used them as the intro to the joint, yeah, yeah, which yeah. I thought was dope. Very much like instantly caught my attention. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that was the game plan. It was like for those people that don't know you all over the world, it'll be like it's an introduction, like showing them who you are. As soon as they see it, they're like, oh, 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 yeah, fuck, oh. <laughs> and then when that drop, when that many man drop comes in, it just gets you. <laughs> it just sucks you in. And then when the beat comes in, you've actually flipped the you've flipped the sample from Coolio Gangster's Paradise. <laughs> and you've put the trapped out drums behind it and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, man, I I get it. I get the song. <laughs> I get what he's done. I'm like, this is real as fuck. I'm yeah. like, it's like a tribute to Coolio. Yeah, hundred yeah, yeah. percent. Shout out to Coolio and 50 Cent. Oh, and Stevie Wonder. <laughs> yeah, so it's, I look at it and it's just like, this is a very well put together song. This will be getting talked about yeah. for quite a while. Now, you know what's funny about that? It wasn't even, it was, I didn't even think of it. There was no thought process behind it. It was just get the beat, bang, record it, boom. Oh yeah, I'm gonna put many men at the start, and I'll sing the coolio, just to pay respect to coolio, bang. Put the song together, done. And everyone else is like, they're taking it different. They're like, oh my god, it's so well thought. He's a genius. <laughs> this is what I mean. I've been doing it for so long. It just the things that I do. It just I don't mean to pull my own leg or anything, but it's just I've been doing it a long time. You know, I mean things just. I guess things just fall into place easy for me when it comes to music and writing music and that, you know. And now look, it's done a hundred Ks, you know, a hundred thousand. Is that a good thing or I don't really pay attention to it. If you ask me a hundred thousand spins in four or five days, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you put on the internet. Yeah. That's a hundred thousand spins. That's a lot. Congratulations on that. Thanks, I, I bro. like the way that you've taken a, a, a fucked up situation and flipped it through music yeah. clearly. Yeah. You are someone who understands the culture. I'm all for the culture, man. Always, always for the culture. That's why I've, I've left the... I, 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 that's why I always try to keep the violence out of it. I don't want these kids to think that I'm, I'm promoting violence. I'm just um, talking about my past story and experiences, man. So I don't want anyone to get it missing screwed, you know? No, absolutely. And I mean, look, um, you've, you know, you, that, that's your latest single. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You've left the street shit alone. Yeah, I'm out of the street, finished, yeah. 
it had a lot to do with my mother passing as well because I promised her uh, actually give the music a, a actual crack, you know what I mean? Because she always knew I was talented since I was young. She used to tell me all the time. She used to be my number one fan. And I promised her before she died, she goes, can you just please give it one more try? Just one try. I know you'll make it. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I will. But then when she passed away, I was still involved in a lot of street shit. And then I ended up bumping into a very good mate of mine that I went to school with and um, we came to an agreement, made a promise to him, stay out of the street, focus on your music and we'll make something big happen. So now the aim of the game is to try to uh, put a permanent footprint in Australian hip hop. I've given, I've, cho I've chosen to give my, my life to music. I want to actually, all these, all, these years, all these years in the past that I've wasted, like just doing all this bullshit in the street, I actually want to pursue music now, full time. Because I really think I've got a strong message that I could, like, my message could influence the youth a lot, you know? Oh, and um, the culture could benefit from it as well. Because I'm, I'm all for the culture. Another thing that, uh, is current is this celebrity boxing match. Oh, bro. Now, the, this bloke. Fill me in. I'll just tell you what I've caught on to. So basically like there was a dude on the internet, I forget his name, you can tell us in a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who wanted to, to do a celebrity boxing match and you've put your hand up, but he's saying that you don't have enough followers or some shit. I felt like he beat my ID. That's why I went at him. Because a few days before, I was like, oh, any motherfucking rapper, you want to talk shit, wait till my arm gets better, we'll put up 10 grand each, we'll have a boxing match, winner takes all. Or we'll donate it to charity. Or we'll give it to me because I'm going to win. And then bang, two days later, really, he, he wasn't directing at that. He didn't bite my ID. I was just trying to be a Hollywood cunt. And then someone tagged me in his post. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm looking for someone to fight. They got to have five, 500,000 followers. Am I correct? Was he saying that? And then I ended up going at him. I was driving to the gym with my brother. I go, hi, I'm Luke Owen. I'm a fucking shit cunt. And I just kept going back and forth. That's how that started. But I got him good, eh? He called me. <laughs> he did? He told me to leave him alone. <laughs> Are you for real? Yeah, when I started um, uh, trolling Jack Doherty and Shami, he goes, oh, bro, can you give me your number? I go, I'm not giving you my number. I go, send me yours and I'll call you. And then um, I ended up calling him and he goes, bro, like, it started off as fun, but do you reckon you could stop? And I was like, why? I go, we're having fun. He goes, nah, man, you're too much. You just troll different. <laughs> he goes, the death threats are too much. I think my fans were death threatening him and Jack. And then he ended up throwing Charmy under the bus. He goes, like, me and Jack, we're good blokes. We're best mates. But fuck Charmy, he's a fucking dog. He goes, go at him, go at him. And then I told him, I go, oh, you know what? I'm not going to take it down, my, my recent post. Because he was telling me to take down the post. And I go, um, I won't take it down, I'll leave it, but I won't go at you anymore. And he was like, oh yeah, man, thanks, man. And then hung up. And that was it? Yeah, that was it. So yeah. there'll be no celebrity boxing match. Bro, we, we offered him 100 grand and he, he, he said he, he wanted a meal. I was like, who the fuck do you think you are? Donut McGregor? This bloke. Go fuck a croissant. <laughs> Hang on, you offered him a hundred grand. Yeah, we offered my camp offered him a hundred grand. My manager goes, offer him a hundred grand. So I was like, oh yeah? Well, I'll give a hundred grand, we'll fight. And he goes, nah man, uh, this was through voice message on Instagram. He goes, nah man, like I got a, like a big following on OnlyFans. I'm, and I wrote back to him, I was like, I don't give a fuck about your OnlyFans. You fucking donuts. And he goes, yeah, uh, it's gotta be a mil, mil plus. And then I messaged him back. I was like, who the fuck do you think you are? Donut McGregor? I go, you're not getting the meal, cunt. Who wants to see you for it? But I think he was just doing it for cloud, eh? Wow. And then so off the back of that, has there been ever any more conversation or thought into, you know, boxing other rappers or other celebrities or anything like that? Um, we'll eventually get to it, probably halfway through next year. But I still don't have range of motion in my arm. When I get 100% better, then we'll do the Sunny Bill. Shout out to Sunny Bill, eh? We'll troll Sunny Bill next year. <laughs> Let me get fit respectfully. Because he's a good man. Now, um, <laughs> you, got, you got boxing. Yeah. And the rap version of boxing is battle rap. Yeah. 
Do you fuck with battle rap? Are you a fan? Yeah, I watch battle rap all the time. You know, my favorite of all time is Disaster. He's the man. This is the man. This is an arsenal. But Mook, murderer. He's the, he's the best. Me personally, I won't battle rap anyone, but I enjoy watching it. I really enjoy watching it. I've been watching it back then since way before URL. Remember the Smack DVDs? But now it's like it's a, yeah. yeah now, now it's big money. Now they they got big money behind them now, eh? Like battles, fifty grand, hundred grand, like the Luke Irwin money, like now, um, <laughs> the pound cake money. <laughs> As someone who's prepared to do the celebrity boxing match thing with another rapper, yeah, would you be prepared to battle rap? I'm not really a battle rapper, man. We can go, we can go song for song where we're both in the studio. Give us the same beat, we both write a song to it, put money up, and I'll beat anyone in this country. You know what I mean? That'd be a different version of battle rap, but not battle rap, you know what I mean? So when I was doing some research, 2010, yeah. you were actually on X Factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about how that came about, how old were you, and what exactly were you doing on X Factor? Because you weren't like a lead uh, performer on there, were you? Yeah, no, I ended up guest performing on it. I was, um, oh, back then I was signed to, um, you, know, you, know, you know what DJ Peter Guns? Oh, yeah, Club Joint All Stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. DJ Peter Guns, I was signed to his label. He's a total fruitcake, but yeah. I was signed to his label, and, um, him and another guy, Rocket 2000, it was called uh, DOX Entertainment. And um, I recorded a shit ton of songs for him. And um, he, he was the one that ended up give, uh, getting me that hookup with uh, X Factor. What actually happened on the show? Oh, on the show, yeah, they ended up uh, calling me in. That was on the season where Mahogany was on. And then we went for a few, uh, a few rehearsals. And um, yeah, I ended up getting the job. So what, when you say you end up getting the job, what actually... Like what, what actually happened? No, nah, because they wanted me to go in and rehearse, like go in and they gave me these lines for this song and they wanted to see how it go. So we went oh. there for like, yeah, me, we went there for three days straight doing it. It was so repetitive, bro. We had to walk out, the cameras were there, but there was no one in the crowd. And then after three days, they were like, oh, okay, you got the job, you got the job. And I was like, fuck it, yeah. And then so what, then you've gone and performed it on TV yeah. for X Factor. Yeah. And then what happened off the back of that, if anything? That brother, like I said, he was a fruitcake. He didn't know what he was doing. You know how much traction we could have like, built off that one? Like I was on TV. Like, this was when back, bro, I've been doing this so long. I, I was getting, when I came on X Factor, I got teased about it. Cause you, you remember back then hip hop wasn't a thing here. Like you try to rap, they'll be like, oh, he thinks he's American. He, he thinks he's this, he thinks he's that. But now it's an actual thing. I wish we could, I wish, like, yeah, no th th these times were back then, you know what I mean? So nothing really kind of, nothing really grew off the back of that X Nah, like nothing, man. They just shelved me. I, I recorded like a hundred songs with them. They didn't release one song. Wow. Yeah, I had some mad, yeah, I had some mad hits with them, man. They released two songs on YouTube. There's one called Keep It Moving, Keep It Moving and Cup Up. <laughs> they were the only two that they released. I was like, bro, you have a diamond. Take advantage of it, market him, do this, do that. But they didn't know what they were doing. Because Peter Guns wanted to go with this side. Because remember he was um, affiliated with Dawn Raid in that? And he wanted me to sound like the New Zealand artist. And his partner wanted me to sound like myself. And then it would collide. Every time we'd go to a studio session, I'd be halfway through my verse. And then Peter would be like, no, nah, no, nah, stop, stop, stop. We need to change the beat. Let me call some producers. It was like an ongoing clusterfuck for, for years. <laughs> Okay, and then so like you mentioned Dawn Raid, then I think a couple of years later you released a song called The Diss. Yeah. Oh yeah, you heard that? <laughs> and that was aimed at a bunch of New Zealand rappers. Everyone. <laughs> I just wanted to go at everyone. No one was recognizing me, man. <laughs> I just got dirty. I was like, I'm better than all of you. No one acknowledged me at all. Like, now they acknowledge me. I talked to all the boys at this on that song. I'm very good friends with them. But at the time, it's like, it's like they knew I was there, but they didn't want to address me. 
So I was like, yeah, okay, and I slowly used over three minutes. So then I just dissed everyone. Yeah, and I mean, look, a couple of the a couple of the names that I noticed on there, like, uh, you know, Savage, yeah, being the main dude. I was like, wow, swing. Um, you know, you had a line in there about about Monster Ganja. Yeah, that yeah. Caught my attention because oh, you listen, huh? There. Shout outs to Monster. <laughs> we're, we're cool as fuck with Monster. So yeah, yeah, nah. Hey, Monster, all the bo- all the boys on this. there, all the boys on there, it's all love, man. I was young, man. I was just trying to, you know, it's 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 rap. Like it's a competitive sport, man. It's like football. But you, you know what? You know what? Other name, Queen Shirley. Oh, uh, or, or Day Hummel. Nah. Yeah, they were the ones that told me it got bored up. That whole this. That they were all aware of it. They just didn't want to acknowledge it. You know what I mean? No one wanted to say anything back. So nobody responded. Nah, to that no one song. responded at all because they knew if they were coming down in their shows, I would have called them at their shows. <laughs> But I'm a changed man. That, like, this is back then. <laughs> okay, off the rip. Yeah. In a nutshell, what yeah. was the motivation behind that song? Why did you put that particular run that, out and who produced it, etc.? Um, I actually forgot who produced it. I bought the, bought the beat on my website called BeatStars. I actually found the beat on YouTube. So I ended up buying it off that, off that website. To be honest, that song's from four years ago. Those lyrics. I just bought a beat and slapped them, slapped the lyrics on that beat. I got I got heaps of shit like that, and the bars are still ahead. And the bars still went over everyone's heads. Now, okay, that's interesting because I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So, the raps, I say four years old. Yeah. You bought the beat. You put this out on YouTube. Sick video. Yeah, yeah. Were you? Why did you take raps that are four years old and drop it now? Why did you not write a new song? No, because I always, I always knew, you know, the listeners in Australia, they're, they're very behind when it comes to bars. Like, you know what I mean? Because like I said, hip hop's just, just arrived in Australia. No one's like, because I'm heavy influenced by, by hip hop culture, you know what I mean? I've been listening since I was five years old. So when people drop music from America, I get every single bar. Doesn't matter how fast they're rapping, you know what I mean? Here they're still, it's here, like hip hop's arrived, but people are still picking up on certain things. Okay, so basically you've dropped old bars because you feel like the audience is, say, four years behind. Yeah, years behind. <laughs> okay, and uh, who shot the video to that one? Uh, the same guy that shot um, uh, Unbreakable. Exactly. And I was going to say, because the visuals have a very, for both those videos, yeah. I could instantly tell it was shot by the same dude because yeah. they just have a unique look. It's got a glaze. That's very color graded wool. That's the, I was trying to figure out what the fuck it is <laughs> about your videos. And th- there you go. Color grade. Yeah. That's, that's the word. Now, um, so you drop that. It's done, you know, nearly a quarter million spins. Yeah. It was more like a throwaway track just to show, it, like just to tell everyone I'm, com- I'm here, I'm coming back. You know what I mean? I wasn't really expecting nothing big out of it. But then, um, there, 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 yeah, there was just a big discussion between me and my brothers and me and the boys about the accent. And a few of um, big name producers that I work with, like Will Stark, Khaled and that, we, we'd go back and forth about me using an Australian accent, but I was totally against it. I was like, nah, fuck these guys. Nah, I'm doing, I'm doing it my way. I'm doing it my way. And they're telling me, nah, the boys are actually doing numbers, like one four. Shout out to one four. And that. Like they're actually doing numbers and making big money off this. It took me a while, a few months of them drilling me in the head, but they they they, they eventually got through. So I thought, yeah, I'll test the waters. So then, um, me and Ghost ended up recording Still Standing, and then we ended up dropping that with uh, without visuals. We got a pretty good response. Uh, out of it as well and then so we're still standing that's on like spotify yeah it's on on, uh, all online platforms yeah okay and did that one did that one get as well received as off the rip uh people accepted it more because it was in the accent the australian versus american uh, accent wars yeah, yeah. has been a thing yeah, yeah. since the days of when like the Hilltop Hoods first yeah, popped yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. But now when you go there, they love our accent. 
Like now it's the sh- you know back in the day when my, I used to hear stories from my aunties and uncles and that when they used to go there they used, they used to tease that accent. This is when I was young. Now you go there, they know you're from here. They love it. You know what I mean? As someone who was rapping more with an American accent, yeah, yeah, yeah. and now is rapping more yeah. with their natural accent, how do you feel about that whole debate? You know, do you feel that now that you rap with, you know, your regular accent, yeah. do you feel like that's the way everyone should do it, or uh, depends what you're trying to do, bro. Uh, Hip hop's a form of expression. You just express yourself how you feel. If you want to do it in the American accent, do it. If you can, if you can do it and make money while you're doing it, perfect. But if you want to do it in the Australian accent, because not everyone's talented and versatile, you know what I mean. You, you like, not everyone can do what I do. Like, just switch to the American and make it sound good. It's a very hard thing to do. Like write, write in a different like in a different accent, make it make sense, and make it sound appealing to your ears. You know what I mean? It's very hard to do. No one gives me enough credit for it. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> if you heard my singing shit, you should be like, man, just be a singer. <laughs> in Australian rap in yeah. 2020, you've got different pockets, different styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you now have your more hip hop sound, yeah, then yeah. you've got your trap sound, like then you've different got your sub-genre like. sound, and then you've got your drill stuff, yeah, yeah. and then you have rap. shit that it doesn't even fit in those categories. It's like a mix <laughs> of whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably the most uh, recent popular subgenre is drill. Um, That's number one right now. Now. Yeah, and you know, shout outs to one four, they're the ones that Yeah, hundred you know, percent the the they paved the way. Australia. If 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 it wasn't for that group, I never liked bigging up anyone, yeah. But if, if it wasn't for one four, it'd be the same thing. No one would be even focused on Australian hip hop. You know what I mean? With that being said, the cursor that's been doing a thing, he'll top hoods and that, but it's like a different type of hip hop. Drew one four sort of opened the gate worldwide, you know. Every, everyone's eyes is on Australia now. What do you think it is about One Four that has made them as successful as they are at the moment? It's a different sound, man. They've capitalised on on that sound, you know. They were the first to come with it. You know, on Changshin Shoot, they used to cop a lot of flack from everyone, man. They used to get teased about it. But you know how, like, first they hate, then they love. You know what I mean? Because I, I used to read a lot of the comments. And they used to be like, oh, you sound stupid, you sound spastic, this, that. And then, bam, when the message hit, game over. That was just something else. And then do you think that, uh, I mean, first of all, do you have a relationship with 1-4, whether it's music uh, with, or... With, with their management and their, and their producers, I do. I'm very close with them. But pers- oh, I speak to Spenny here and there. I've spoken to J- yep. JM on um, FaceTime. When he was at one of uh, the boys' houses, but I shout out to one four man. There's always love between them. Like we're practically from the same area. Mm. And then, so do you think that, besides the production, yeah, that credibility, yeah, has anything to do with their success? Yeah, they're, they're speaking their truth. They're actually like young young thugs from Mount Jewel. They're just speaking their truth. You know what I mean? They're like mm. Australia's first drill group. And I know for a fact that everything they say in their music is true. And now when you first saw their first song, yeah, first video, what was your first initial impression that you Which, can remember? You mean like the message or Shanks and Chiefs? Everything like when you first heard... To me it was unusual because it was in the accent. I'm the, I, I was... I'm more into American hip hop, you know. I mean, to me, it was unusual. I didn't start taking notice until the message popped off. When that popped off, that's when I was like, it, it got me. Mm. Now, with drill music, obviously, the nature of the content, yeah. it becomes very controversial. Yeah. And even in hip hop, uh, there's always been the question of um, do the lyrics perpetuate the violence? Or are the lyrics merely just a reflection 
of the artist's reality. Yeah, bro, the lyrics are just a reflection of the artist's environment, you know what I mean? You're a product, product of your environment. It's these other drill groups that try to imitate the actual dudes that have been through it that are causing all of this ruckus, the stabbings and all that, you know what I mean? So do you feel that the drill music does play a part in, you know, young kids stabbing really, each other Not really, it's just the way the shit. kids interpretate the message. I'd be co contradicting myself if I said drills is what motivates the violence. It's just the, the way the kids receive the message. That's what it is, you know what I mean? Before, I used to give them a lot of flow. I used to talk shit. All oh, drillers, he's a troublemaker, he's the other reason why the stabbings are happening. But really, that's not true. It's these kids, they're illiterate. The way they receive the message is different, you know what I mean? These guys are talking about their truths, like their, their, their reality, and these other kids are taking it as, yeah, go pick up a knife, Gucci bag, yeah, meet up 20 blokes, stab, you know what I mean? And then people end up getting hurt over, like, nothing. Over misinterpretation of a line. <laughs> now, we, we talk about, uh, you know, one four's credibility. Yeah. Um, they, hey, they got credibility one four, man, straight up. Out of all the dudes that are flexing in that way yeah. on the mic in Australia, yeah. what percentage of them do you feel are really telling their truth and what percentage do you feel are just embellishing or just straight out lying? 5% are authentic. The rest, they're just doing it for clout, fame and bitches. How dangerous do you think that is, both to the artist and to the people that are that's listening bad, to the artist? That's bad, man. Because now, now you send a whole different, like a fucked up message to the next generation that's coming up. You know what I mean? Like, just lies. Just lie your way to the top. It's all right. Just do that. Just lie. Like, I come from a different era where you had to have walked in those shoes to be able to speak about that. It's like pretty unfortunate that only five... Like this, that's just my opinion. Other people might think different, you know? But... From what I've seen and what I know, from what I hear in the street, probably about this five to ten percent that are authentic. The rest are just fucking clowns. That's why I get hated a lot because of that. Because I say that online. That's my message, you know. Oh, because you're calling people out. Yeah, it's fake. not. Really, it's not really calling out. It's just telling, like, don't lie. You know what I mean? Hip hop's a form of expression. Why would you express a lie? You know what I mean? You express your truth, not a lie. And then, so would you put your music in the drill basket, the hip hop basket? How would you describe your music? I don't really know, man. When I play it to people, they say it's not drill, it's just a drill beat. You know what I mean? I guess if you put me in the category of drill, then I'd fall under the, the whole postcode thing. But I don't represent the postcode, I represent a movement. It's all the Raiders, you know what I mean? DRM, Three Move Records. So. And on the, on the mention of postcodes, um, now, oh, somewhere along all day the lines, about that. yeah. Now, somewhere along the lines, I've caught on that you hate dudes repping their postcodes and shit. So petty, it's stupid. The the reason why it gets me is because I go to my sister's house and like nephews come up and they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, what does six five mean? What does thing? You know what I mean? It really hurts me when I when I hear that shit. Like it's really starting to influence the younger ones. Back when I was in the street, I didn't give a fuck about the younger ones. I was like, hey, fuck that. But you know when you grow, grow older and you start seeing that your actions actually have an impact on the people that's under you or coming up in that? Mm. Like a lot of these people just think I'm, a lot of people just think I'm blabbing shit online, but like there's always a message behind my rant. You know? No, I can totally tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's to me, it's, to me, I'm 36 years old, yeah. you know, so. I probably look at things a bit differently than 26. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the 20 year old they hate me. They're like, he's a fucking gronk. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then hey, they, they, hey, they end up, they keep watching, keep watching, and then they end up coming around a month or two later. Like, I got a message the other day from this bloke that used to troll me bad. He was like, bro, straight out, this whole time I thought you were a shit talker. After I heard Unbreakable and your story and this, man. Keep spreading your message. Yeah, put a smile on my face. The whole hello, hello dickhead. Hello, <laughs> I was waiting for that. I was sitting there when you started the, the, the interview. I was like, I wonder when he's going to ask me about the hello, dickhead. 
Now, what, 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 what's the story behind? It's just fucking hilarious. Like it gets you every time. Mate. <laughs> what, what's the story behind that? Like, where did that come from? Oh, my, my little nephew. My, my little nephew, Dina. Man, I've got to bring him on the interview one time, mate, and say, this is the man responsible for Hello Dickhead. And we just used to drink at mine. We used to get on, you know, nosebies, this, that. And he just used to, like, be a little smart ass. He'd be in the next room or he'd call. And I'd be like, oh, hello. And he'd be like, hello, Dickhead. And then he'd come and then do the eye thing. I'd be sleeping, wake up. He's waking me up and then he'd do his eyes like that. He'd be like, hello, Dickhead. I end up slapping him and chasing him around the house. I'd go, come here, you little motherfucker. <laughs> And then it was like a, like a, just like a personal joke between me and my brothers and that. And then um, when I started trolling, uh, you know who, it just came to my head. I was like, this bloke, like this, that, blah, blah, blah. Hello, dickhead. And they just went spastic online. <laughs> I was tripping out. Oh, wow. Everyone was sending me all these messages. Oh, bro, can you send me a hello, dickhead? I'll pay you for it. <laughs> really? Yeah. People messaging me, asking me to send them a video of me saying that and they'll pay me bro you should do t-shirts yeah it's it's coming soon it's coming soon unbreakable hello dickhead all that shit's coming soon there's a lot of other business ventures that we can't talk about but you will be very very surprised if i ask you big cash top five american mcs yeah that come to head not in order but yeah. just the top five that come to mind who are your favorites all time all time 50 Cent, Eminem, Kevin Gates, Dr. Dre. One more, one more. Bro, there's heaps, man. I got like 15 and want to put in that fifth spot. <laughs> Chuck them all in for conversation. Fucking. Who else, who else, who else? Uh, Royster 5'9. Boom. Yeah. Those five. Now, if I then ask you the same question. Yeah. But for Australia. Australian rappers? Current. Current? And current. Yeah. Who's your top five? You want me to be honest? You want me to be honest? I don't have a top five here. Because? I'm too big, I take up all five spots. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> there's no space for five when there's a gorilla in the room. Ooh. <laughs> but no, but when it, to be honest, uh, if you want me to pick, if you if you want to force me to pick, I'd, I'd probably number one would be probably one four. But I reckon he'd be neck and neck with Cursor because Cursor's been doing this a long time, man. And he's probably the, he's making more bank than anyone. Than anyone. Spanion? 100% Spanion. Spanion's Australia's immortal technique. But he doesn't get, not, all his bars go over everyone's heads. You know what I mean? Um, who else, who else? Uh, obviously Big Cash. Um, number five. I, I can't be included, eh? So I've got two more. Um, Rops and um, who else? Who else? Who else? Um, Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne. You know Melbourne? That Melbourne rapper, Melbourne official. Have you collaborated with any of those artists? No. <laughs> oh, he's trying to get me to give myself up, aren't you? <laughs> no, I just think, look, I, when you mention your top five, right? As a DJ, yeah, yeah. I just think Spanion and Big Cash would be a dope collab, man. That would blow the Never fucking know. internet apart. Uh, All right? yeah. And I can tell by the look in your eye that maybe I'm saying something <laughs> that you're already working on. No, nah, this is the Patron, <laughs> nigga. <laughs> this is the Patron getting me lit. Hey, you know, I actually got like a few messages, eh? Everyone's like, I have a feeling you went Spanish. And I'm like, we're not doing anything. Come on. We're just mates. <laughs> well, if it happens. If it happens, it happens, man. Bro, it'd be big for the culture. Eh? It'd, be, it'd be crazy. It'd be massive. So, Spanian, if you're listening and this isn't happening already. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
He's on the ice. He's on the ice. No, I'm playing. <laughs> The, the, the last thing. Oh, yeah.